Alan. Good, after good afternoon, everybody. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. Um, and thank you for joining us at this uh, pre-IOC Assembly uh, thematic webinar, uh, where we will focus on the recent activities undertaken as part of the IOC's capacity development agenda. I'm Alan Evans, and I am co-chair of the IOC group of experts on capacity development and I'll be co-hosting this webinar with my um, group of experts co-chair but as many of you will also know him as the chair of the IOC Ariel Triosi. We have three key talks to share with you today two focusing on efforts undertaken by the group uh, of experts on capacity development and a third one on one of the IOC, IOC's established capacity development frameworks, namely the Ocean Teacher Global Academy. However, before we head straight into the talks, I'd like to pass over to Ariel, who would like to add some context to the upcoming talks. And he'll do this by sharing a timeline of the IOC's capacity development efforts and why a need for the group of experts and its associated task teams and the activities undertaken by them. So please enjoy the webinar and I look forward to hearing from you at the questions and answers. So over to you, Ariel. Thank you very much, uh, Alan. Good day to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here with you uh, uh, virtually. Uh, of course, we all miss meeting you uh, in, in person. Uh, as uh, Alan has uh, introduced, uh, I, I would like to go very briefly through this timeline. Of course, I will not go all the way down. We all know that capacity development is one of the cornerstones of our, of our commission of IOC. And we can go back to the times of uh, training and education through mutual assistance, TEMA, et cetera. But if we get closer in time, uh, just in, in this uh, century, uh, we had a spearhead uh, that was the IODE, the uh, International Oceanographic Data and Information Exchange Program, with its Ocean Teacher Initiative. That's, then it turned into the Ocean Teacher Academy, and uh, later it became the Ocean Teacher Global Academy with its network of uh, regional training centers and now specialized training centers. And at the same time, uh, we had the regional training and research centers established in the Westpac region. So we had this universe of initiatives in terms of capacity development, particular, in particular for human resources. Uh, by 2015, IOC conducted an initial gap analysis uh, and then it was presented to the 28th assembly uh, to find out how we were uh, dealing with capacity development and with our strategy. And two years later for the next assembly, the 29th assembly, uh, we had an implementation report on capacity development and it was uh, deemed necessary to create a group of experts on capacity development. So this group of experts uh, GCD was established in order to assist member states in implementing the strategy, the city strategy that was adopted back in 2015. So we had a first meeting of the group of experts in 2018. And from there, uh, we uh, started with two uh, task teams, two, two groups, subgroups that dealt with the particular needs and requirements of capacity, on capacity development of member states of IOC, besides our regional subsidiary bodies that probably were not part of them or not uh, represented by a uh, subsidiary body. And the other task team dealt with the transfer of marine technology and the uh, development of a clearinghouse mechanism. This group of experts also dealt with the first IUC survey on capacity development requirements that was in 2018. Uh, we had subsequent meetings of the task teams and uh, discussions with regional subsidiary bodies we reached out to IUC global programs and we presented 
uh, a report on the survey to the 30th assembly in 2019, whilst at the same time, and thanks to the support of the uh, one of our uh, projects, uh, the Caribbean Marine Atlas second phase, we were able to develop uh, a prototype of a clearinghouse mechanism, thanks also to the uh, hard work and support of Invermar Colombia. So by 2020, we were able to further develop the idea of a clearinghouse mechanism, and we started two projects, the Ocean Info Hub and the Ocean Teacher Global Academy second phase, and for that, we need to thank the government of Flanders Kingdom, Belgium for the uh, financial support. We had a second meeting in October 2020 of our group of experts on capacity development. And we dealt with a mandate we received from, uh, from the IOC assembly in 2019. That was the second IOC capacity development survey. We will hear more about that survey in a few minutes. Another important development is in December 2020, the Global Ocean Science Report was, was published. And we always made a link, a very strong link, between the work of the group of experts and the Global, Oceans, uh, Global Ocean Science Report uh, as a means to identify requirements and capabilities in our member states. But Something that I would like to share with you too is that at our second meeting of the group of experts, we found out that it was important to look again into the IOC capacity development strategy that was meant to finish in 2021. And uh, we will hear about uh, this uh, in the presentation by the chair of this task team. Without any further ado, I would like to now pass the floor to Joanna Diwa. And she will make, uh, she will give us a presentation on the outcomes uh, of the second capacity development needs assessment survey. Joanna, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Ariel. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure to start with the first presentation. Can we open up this slide? Thank you. Next slide, please. As instructed by the 30th session of the IOC Assembly, the 2020 CD Needs Assessment Survey was conducted from September last year to February 2021. The survey was based on the 2018 sur um, survey and this time expanded the scope of CD stakeholder groups. Overall, we received 1,005 responses from 118 countries. The analysis focused on 115 developing country member states, from which we, we received 25 IOC focal points and 10 CD focal points responses. As for the gender breakdown, 61% of the respondents were male and 38% were, were female. As for the stakeholder groups breakdown, you can see that um, about 63% of the respondents came from practitioners groups, such as ocean researchers, academic staff from learning service providers and students from higher education institutions. Next slide, please. The poll results of the survey are now available online at uh, surveys.ioc-cd.org, um, um, where you can find more details, um, detailed responses of individuals and stakeholder groups. These initial results were presented at various group of experts meeting and very recently at the IO Caribe Assembly last month. The overall analysis involved all stakeholder groups and the regional analysis involved all regions and all capacity groups. And country reports are also available for summary of responses of countries with focal points and substantial number of stakeholders. Next slide, please. The survey is quite extensive um, to be fully covered here. So for the purpose of my presentation today, let me share some outcome highlights. The rest of the results, as I said, were uploaded online. So after this webinar, perhaps you can just check out the page and communicate, communicate with us for further details. So here, for example, when asked which of the CD needs are the most critical that currently are not available in their countries, the top results identified by the IOC focal points were funding and investment, access to communities of practice, increased awareness, ocean literacy, and public outreach, 
ocean observation equipment, access to remotely sensed satellite data. Next slide, please. On questions related to the UN Decade of Ocean Science, here we can see in the yellow box that Challenge 7 um, was the top decade um, challenge for CD needs or greatest, and then um, also challenges 5 and 4. And similar question and decade objectives resulted to Objective 3, um, which is increase the use of ocean knowledge and understanding and develop capacity to contribute to sustainable development solutions. Next slide, please. On SDG 14, 96% of the IOC focal points confirmed that SDG 14 is a national priority in their countries. 87% believed that they have significant and partial capacity to achieve SDG 14, while 13% believe their capacity is very low. When asked which aspect of capacity is lacking to achieve SDG 14, 100% of the responses pointed to capacity to translate science to policy as um, the aspects of capacity. Okay. So on national CD strategy and needs assessment, 54% of the IOC focal points indicated the absence of a national ocean science strategy and 63% reported that there has not been any capacity needs assessment conducted in their country. Next, please. Two questions regarding the impact of COVID-19, both yielded negative um, answers on overall contribution and support to IOC capacity development activities. Next slide, please. Um, almost 75% of respondents positively rated marine national coordination on marine research, while 26% claimed it was um, poor. More than half, that's 57% answered that marine scientific research is significantly linked to policy needs in their countries, while 4% said there's no link at all. On the question whether the output of graduates is linked to human resources needs of the national research institutions, 50% um, answered yes and 45% were no. On, um, the question whether there is an active policy to promote the use of local marine research expertise in the private sector, 48% were yes, and 43 said there was none. Next slide, please. 64% of respondents from government official, officials group indicated that national plan or institutional mechanisms are in place to support the development of ocean science capacity in their country. About 80% to 90% agreed that research institutions followed by international organizations and regional organizations were some non-governmental stakeholders that are mostly involved in decision-making processes to come up with, with action plans um, to implement ocean policies. Lastly, when asked about the most frequent obstacles to implementing ocean-related policy, they identified limited financial resources, lack of technical capacities, and lack of access to data and information. <laughs> um, next slide, thank you. Now, as I have mentioned earlier, given that a key focus of the survey was to specifically assess the capaci capacity needs requirements of member states and show regional priorities here we have four tables to enable comparisons not only across regions, but also across capacity groups. So you have the first table for IOC focal points, the second one for CD focal points, the third one for representatives of their organization or institution, and the fourth one is individual practitioners who filled in the survey on personal capacity. We have columns for Africa, Latin American, Caribbean, West, Western Pacific, and small island developing states, and the rest belong to others. Due to the relatively small sample sizes, care must be taken when interpreting the results and making assumptions based on the data presented here. Um, all data were presented according to weighted average. You can see the dark green cells as the highest and the red were the lowest. Now, in terms of the most critical capacity development needs to build ocean science capacity, the results of the regional analysis um, uh, revealed, as you can see in the yellow box, it's funding and in investment. 
for representative groups, um, international partnerships are important, um, strengthening international partnerships and regional networks for collaboration. And um, for the personal group, um, it's ocean observation equipment um, as top CD needs. On the other hand, um, CD focal points from Latin American Caribbean ranked increased awareness, ocean literacy, and public outreach, as well as higher power computing as higher CD needs. But um, we already note that the high ranking for higher power computing was in stark contrast, as it is one of the um, Hold on. as it is one of the um, uh, least uh, ranked CD needs by the representatives and personal groups in Latin America, Latin America and Caribbean region. Um, yes, next slide, please. In terms of developing capacity in human resources, increased collaboration with UNESCO chairs and IOC, um, ranked high in Africa and Latin America. Um, for IOC focal point groups, as well as establishment of visiting um, lecturer programs. The representatives and personal groups ranked advanced professional development training courses and continuous professional development as their top CD needs, as well as establishment of an internship fellowship program. Next slide, please. In terms of increased access to physical infrastructure, as you can see in the yellow box, access to best practices on the use and maintenance of physical infrastructure and equipment was ranked high by the CD focal points groups and the practitioners groups. And it's in um, contrast with the low ranking of um, the specific CD needs by the IOC focal point group. The personal and representative groups across regions also ranked training on the use and maintenance of physical infrastructure and equipment as top CD needs. Next slide, please. Um, in the interest of time, I, I don't have um, much time to give you all the regional analysis table, but you can um, visit the um, website for the complete um, results. Now, here is the uh, context, in the context of the ocean decade challenges, as you can see in the yellow box, it's challenge seven. Um, that's capa where capacity development needs are greatest across the regions and groups. The personal groups across regions gave higher ranking to challenge four and challenge five was also ranked as, a, a chal uh, as a, one of the top challenges across regions. Next slide, please. And here is the ocean decade objectives. Um, you can, you, you, you'll notice that um, most of them had high um, scores, um, but most especially of objective three um, increasing the use of ocean knowledge and understanding and developing capacity. Okay, um, next slide, please. So in view of the low respondent numbers for the other three groups, it is difficult to draw general findings from the results. Um, with the last group on personal capacity having more significant respondent numbers. But what can be logically drawn from the analysis is the strong expression of a need for capacity enhancement across the board, as indicated by the few scores below four that you've seen in the um, tables. Now, some more important observations also include funding and investment is one of the top CD needs, gender equality still among the least grant, regional priorities and CD requirements were identified, and are expected to contribute to regional work planning and interventions. Regarding the decade, we identified the challenges and objectives um, where CD needs were greatest, and hopefully this will contribute to the decade programs um, planned in the next few years. Um, capacity to translate science into policies. I think um, this, is, um, this is one of the, 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 the highlights that we would like to um, underline. It's identified as most lacking capacity. And this is very important for decision-making um, based on science. The respondents also provided insights for potential revision of the IOC CD strategy and its implementation plan. And lastly, the results suggest poor linkage between focal points and target communities as you've seen in the comparative table. 
there seems to be a disconnect between the views of practitioners and national officials. Um, as for my last slide, my last slide are some recommendations such as um, uh, highly encouraging that member states nominate CD focal points as they are vital in coordination of CD efforts such as this. Involvement and representation of stakeholder groups are crucial, most, most especially to contribute to the decade objectives. Um, though national efforts to institutionalize CD programs are critical, they may get overshadowed if needs are not made clear, as we've seen large group of responses from practitioners and limited number of focal points participating in the survey. Um, there should be more active engagement and direct reach with national networks of relevant stakeholder groups involved in ocean-related activities. Continuous efforts are needed to reach out to countries for more responses and representation in the results. And communication impediments um, should be addressed, um, such as the um, updated contact information of focal points. And um, finally, the regular assessments are important to address gaps. Having said this, the next survey is planned for 2022. That's next year. So hopefully, we'll hear more from you and the member states um, who will be participating in the future surveys. Um, this is all for, for now. Back to you, Ariel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Joanna, for this very comprehensive uh, report on the results of the survey. Uh, I know you have much more information in, in store for us uh, and waiting for questions from, the, from our participants. And uh, if you allow me now, I would like to pass the floor to Claudia Delgado, and uh, she will be uh, presenting us the Ocean Teacher Global Academy, um, the IUC Capacity Development Tool. Uh, Claudia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Um, good day, everyone. Let me just just something here. Um, thank you. Um, well, as you all know, 2020 has been marked by an unprecedented disruption at the global scale, and the World Health Organization declared the COVID-19 as a pandemic on March 11, 2020. And as countries imposed strict lockdowns, classrooms were left empty. Uh, Tev, please. And an estimated 1.37 billion students were out of school by March 24th. This empty blackboard may well represent uh, 2020, at least for uh, education and training overall. Uh, next, please. Um, as such, schools and uh, academia and other training providers had to quickly adapt and find alternatives to continue delivering training uh, and teaching. Next, please. So fortunately, IOC was in a good position to continue facilitating training through its Ocean Teacher Global Academy. And despite lockdowns and restrictions to international traveling, OTGA could quickly adapt and move on to fully online training, having organized over 15 online training courses in the last year. Uh, next, please. So the Ocean Teacher has been around for some time already, as, um, as it has been uh, mentioned. Before, the second phase of the Ocean Teacher Global Academy started in April 2020. It's a three-year uh, project funded by the government of Flanders, Belgium. It builds on the legacy of the previous projects and includes new initiatives and uh, challenges now in place, such as the 2030 Agenda, the SDGs, and the UN Decade uh, for Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Its main goals are to, one, develop a portfolio of packaged courses related to the needs of IOC and other partners and stakeholders, and two, to deliver courses online and or blended learning on demand. Uh, next, please. So the e-learning platform is the backbone of Ocean Teacher. As a learning management system, it facilitates face-to-face -face training, uh, learning, blended and online learning. Uh, next. So the platform allows the sharing of content and learning between organizations and stakeholders, allows the co-creation of content and knowledge and the recognition for the organizations as well as the course developers. And of course, being online, it's widely available. One can learn anywhere at any time. It enables the creation of a community of practitioners and it allows learner collaboration. Next, but what is e-learning? 
E-learning can be defined as the use of computer and internet technologies to deliver a broad array of solutions to enable learning. What e-learning is not, is uh, simply conducting classroom training using a web conferencing a tool or channel. And in fact, e-learning can offer effective instructional methods, such as practicing with associated feedback, combining collaboration activities with self-based study, personalizing learning paths based on learners' needs and background, and using simulation and games. Um, but can e-learning be used to develop any type of skills? Well, not necessarily. Uh, the cognitive domain is the most suitable for e-learning, and therefore most existing e-learning courses are developed precisely to build cognitive skills as opposed to other types of skills. And when is it adequate to use e-learning? Next. Many organizations nowadays use e-learning, not only due to the constraints brought by the pandemic, but because it can be as effective as classroom training at a lower cost. Of course, developing e-learning is more expensive than preparing classroom materials and training the trainers, especially if multimedia or highly interactive methods are used. However, in the long term, delivery costs, including costs of web servers and technical support, are considerably lower than those for classroom facilities, instructor time, participants travel, etc. And an added value is the, um, a side effect, uh, a lower carbon footprint. Uh, next. Now for the, the skeptical ones, uh, I know there are many, um, COVID-19 pandemic may have brought momentum and even an urgent need to move on to distance learning. But in fact, different forms of distance learning have been around for quite a while. Uh, next. And in fact, in 2015, the Qingdao Declaration became the first global declaration on the use of ICTs in education. This declaration highlights the different ways in which technology can support the global agenda for education and training. And it states, the remarkable advances of information and ICTs and the rapid expansion of internet connectivity have made today's world increasingly interconnected, as we now know, and made the knowledge more accessible for everyone. To achieve the goal of inclusive and equitable education and lifelong learning by 2030, ICTs must be harnessed to strengthen education systems, knowledge dissemination, information access, quality and effective learning, and more efficient service provision. Next, please. So one common question is, is e-learning, is learning online as effective as face-to-face -face learning? Next. Um, well, research suggests that online learning can increase retention of information. Um, unfortunately, the effectiveness differs based on income group, likely due to the ability to fully leverage the benefits of remote learning based on internet connectivity, digital skills, and or appropriate access to technology. For those who do have access to the right technology and, and infrastructure, there is evidence that learning online can be more effective. This is mostly due to students being able to learn faster online than in a traditional classroom setting, since students can learn at their own pace, going back and rereading, skipping or accelerating through concepts as needed. The next. But uh, to get the full benefit of online learning, one needs to go beyond replicating a traditional classroom through web conferencing. And instead, using a range of collaboration tools and engagement methods, such as gamification, simulators, and virtual reality should be explored. A growing body re um, research-based knowledge uh, is currently available and supports the implementation of good quality e-learning experiences. Uh, tab. Of course, uh, one cannot ignore the digital divide. Not everyone has access to the necessary tools to online training, especially low-income students, nor that online training can fully replace face-to-face -face training. Next. So OTGA strives to deliver the best quality training possible. And to this aim, the OTGA um, Secretariat established a quality management system that supports the design and delivery of the training services. The ISO standard um, 2990 uh, specifies these requirements for providers of learning services in non-formal education and training, as is the case for Ocean Teacher. 
tab, please. And in 2018, the IOD Project Office, the home of the Ocean Teacher Global Academy, achieved the ISO standard certification on learning services for non-formal education and training upon fulfilling these requirements of the international standard. Next, please. But back to the OTGA approach, is OTGA delivering online courses only? Uh, no, that is not the, the case and not, or, not the purpose, sorry. An essential component of the OTGA approach to training is its global network of training centers. OTGA works in partnership with the IOC member states and its institutions, and it's now a network of 16 regional and specialized training centers. Next, please. And here you can see a, a list of the current um, training centers. And these um, regional and specialized training centers play an essential role um, in OTGA as they help tailoring courses to the regional specific needs. They provide training in the languages that are relevant to the regions, besides, of course, hosting the face-to-face -face courses. Next. So where does OTGA fit in the IOC capacity development uh, strategy? Um, how does it contribute to it? As you might be aware, uh, the IOC achieves its high level objectives by engaging the member states and, uh, and the larger ocean science in different programs. And OTGA directly contributes to function F uh, at the center, but in fact, it contributes to all its functions by facilitating training in the topics specific to each function. Next, please. And just to um, give uh, some examples, so when it comes to IOC um, capacity development strategy, the ocean teacher specifically contributes to output number one, human resources developed, and uh, specifically uh, for 1.2, continuous professional development by, uh, next slide, please, by, um, promoting and assisting with the organization of training courses, workshops, and summer schools, and promoting assist and assisting with the establishment of training centers and facilitating the sharing of the training resources. Next, please. So although Ocean Teacher primary focus is to deliver training that enables IOC and its member states achieving its high level objectives and including the UN, UN agenda and its SDGs, OTGA um, continuously collaborates with many other organizations from UN organizations to academia and um, other stakeholders. Besides organ organizing joint courses with these, OTGA has hosted or facilitated training courses for a number of other organizations in the past years. Next, please. So it is clear that we need to provide more opportunities for lifelong learning in order to reach all those who need it throughout their careers. As just mentioned on the previous slide, OTJ fosters collaborations beyond UNESCO IOC to position itself as the training platform for ocean-related topics within the UN and beyond. An ocean academy should offer free online blended and classroom courses and modules related to many ocean topics with the implementation of the SDGs in mind. This could become the training hub uh, when looking for specific training um, not only during the ocean decade, but beyond it. Next, the COVID-19 pandemic triggered a fundamental change on how we look into and ensure that education and training does not stop. Over one year after the first lockdowns, it is clear that blended learning formats, including the enhanced use of technology for training, are here to stay and should become the new normal. Let us, not waste, let us not waste what we learned during this pandemic and use this as an opportunity to, to rebuild and reset better. Next, please. So in a nutshell, IOC, IOC through its Ocean Teacher Global Academy is ready to deliver the training we need for the ocean we want. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Claudia, for this presentation on our TGA second phase. And now the next uh, presentation to follow, I would like to ask uh, Luis Pinedo to take the floor. He will be giving us a presentation on IOC capacity development strategy revision, the chair of the task team devoted to that. 
Uh, Luis, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to this meeting. I would ask you to share my screen. Okay, thank you very much. So if you can show just the next slide, please. So the idea um, here of this presentation is to give you an overview of what are the results of a task team that was created to look at the revision of the IOC strategy on capacity development. So our objective of the team was to analyze if there were any reasons for and to develop the rationale to support the revision of the IOC capacity development strategy 2015-2021. I shared this team, I had the honor to share it, and we were 16 experts. We had the first meeting in December uh, 2020, in which we reviewed our terms of reference and we produced our work plan. We had a second meeting in February, in which we discussed the inputs and summarized the results of the consultations that we did. And we also incorporated things like analyzing the Global Ocean Science Report, the implementation plan for the decade, and also the, the outcomes of the second CD needs uh, survey uh, from IOC. Finally, we submitted in, in March uh, this, uh, this report to the IOC. If you could have the next slide, please. So what are the main reasons and the main elements that we use to justify the revision of the current strategy? Of course, the outcomes of the second IOC capacity development needs survey, which Joanna has already presented to you. Also the capacity development chapter of the implementation plan of the UN decade where there is also a chapter on capacity development. The feedback then of uh, the consultations that we did with the IOC global and regional programs related to capacity development, and also the consultations with UN specialized agencies, non-UN IGOs, global and regional organizations, programs and projects, NGOs and private sector partners. Next slide, please. So, uh, first of all, we looked and we did a comparison of what we have in terms of the IOC CD strategy, the current one, and also the CD chapter on Ocean Decade. I'm not going into the details in here, but anyway, there is some rephrasing, uh, some new ideas that were brought into the, um, into the, the chapter on IOC uh, uh, capacity development by the implementation plan for the decade. Uh, in many cases, it's just rewarding, it's reordering of the desired results and the priority activities. But if I can have the next slide. So in some cases, it's mainly a detail of what was already there. In some cases, like for instance, here you see, instead of sharing information and support identification, it's more direct because it's assumed that sharing of information is used. In some cases, there is some detail like here on including museums, zoos, and aquariums on this training. In some cases, we still think that the IOC strategy uh, still has some points which are not included in the new chapter on the, the decade implementation plan that should be kept. The next slide, please. And so here again, uh, we have a bit more um, development in the case of the chapter on, on the implementation plan uh, compared with the IOC strategy. But the key ideas are there. Also, some, some uh, of these points have been um, updated, uh, taking into account uh, the developments, namely of the pandemics. So if I could have the next slide. So besides doing this comparison, we did consultations with the global and regional programs, as we mentioned before, UN special agencies, IGOs, global and regional pro pro uh, programs. And we sent a large number of emails. And um, what we got as main suggestions and comments, one of the things which we think is really critical, and this has been highly uh, highlighted, is the need for long-term CD sustained strategies. This is crucial and we need to make governments and countries aware of these and the IOC guidelines should be the, 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 the tool to do this. Also, it has been recognized that there is a need for continuous monitoring, evaluation and assessment of the quality and impact of the capacity development activities. So this is a process that needs to be carried on um, with, a, with a, a, a certain regularity so that we really can access how things are impacting 
on, on the different countries. Also, it has rec been recognized the need for partnerships between developed countries, SEEDs and LC LDCs for the implementation of capacity development measures. Also, the integration of natural science, human science in some societal disciplines for a holistic uh, assessment of the marine environment is considered crucial. And uh, global challenges such as climate change, biodiversity, habitat loss should be central in CD strategies and initiatives. Finally, uh, it has been recognized the need to remove and to help remove gender and geographic biodiversity barriers and access and uh, promote and guarantee an equitable access to ocean knowledge through ocean education. And as uh, so we've seen just before by the presentation of uh, Claudia, OTGA has a, a critical role on this. So if I could have the next slide, please. So emerging issues that have been raised is the fact that we need to reach policymakers. So it's critical that we reach them and encourage them to, to, to implement SDGs and other UN processes going on. Also, the science policy interface is considered essential for the development and implementation of legal institution, ocean governance frameworks. And again, the, the, the terms of reference and the, the guidelines that we get from the from the, the strategic development plan are essential to be communicated to decision makers. Again, the role of uh, capacity development has to be more specific and reinforced in making um, uh, seats and LDCs as a priority in strategy. And we wish to develop productive capacities in these different countries for better and more resilient and inclusive future. Again, the cooperation uh, with other UN organizations, regional and national institutions, and also the private sector are considered critical so that we can develop um, uh, capacity development as a whole uh, throughout the world. Could I have the next slide, please? Again, the question of gender. Uh, there needs to reinforce the role of uh, gender balance, traditional indigenous, indigenous knowledge being incorporated into CD strategies and social inclusion have been highlighted. The need to remove the barriers in also generational and geographical biodiversity to ensure equitable access to the ocean for all. And the need for more support for the creation and maintenance of interoperable ocean data sets at national level and uh, also their uh, interoperability. Also, it's critical that seeds and less developed countries have open access to the data generated by developed countries. And it's critical that can manage this data that they produce as well. And also that they have all the tools to convert these data into information. Also, uh, there should be, uh, uh, an, uh, there is also been an highlight on the need for a standardized international approach to sustainable knowledge of the oceans as part of the capacity development strategies. So if we could have the next slide. The other um, uh, document that we've also revised is the Global Ocean Science Report recently released. And of course, here there is the question of the need for enhanced funding in science, the need for continuous collection of comparable data on investments in ocean science in different countries so that we have an overall perspective and we also are able to convince countries to invest more in ocean science, the need to facilitate co-design of ocean science by involving uh, users and producers, to promote multi-stakeholders partnerships and also operationalize the transfer of marine technology, move towards science capacity development with equal participation of all countries, gender and ages, embracing local and indigenous knowledge. So again, here we have the similar worries from uh, different documents. Um, developing strategies and implementation plans to support career needs of women and particularly young uh, scientists and ocean experts, find solutions to remove barriers to open access to ocean data. And again, here it's the need also to, to give the technology so that people can convert it to information, foster, education and training, 
and also assess the impact of COVID pandemic on the technology and capacity development in ocean science. Can I have the next slide, please? So what are the key recommendations? So first of all, it has been recognized looking at all these documents and the assessments and the consultations that we've done, that there is a need uh, for the group of experts in, in, uh, in uh, capacity development to revise the terms of reference to allow the continuation of its work on revising the IOC strategy. So there is a clear need to revise this strategy for the period 2023-2030. Then we will think that it's important that the, the group of experts prepares a proposal for submission of the revised uh, strategy at the 32nd assembly in, uh, in 2023. Uh, also, there is a need to consider what should be the appropriate form and structure and also the ideal length of this document so that we make sure that there is a large audience that reads it. And we need to promote the visibility of this document and this is that this is used in the different countries as a guide for the implementation of the capacity development activities. Finally, we think that it's criti critical that this document reaches the decision makers. And so we are wondering how we should make this. And some suggestion has been that we should do uh, uh, probably an infographic uh, brief uh, resume with the key messages that can be easily re read by, by decision makers and to make them aware of the importance of the national um, involvement and priorities in capacity development so that we can reach uh, the, 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 the state of capacity throughout the world that we really wish. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Luis. Thank you very much for your clear presentation. Thank, thanks to all our speakers today in, in this uh, webinar. And now it's the turn uh, the, uh, for the Q&A session. I would like to hand over the floor to my colleague, Coach Alan Evans. Alan. Thank you, Ariel. Um, thank you, uh, all the speakers, Johanna, uh, Claudia, and Luis. Uh, I think what is clear from your respective presentations is A, that there's a lot going on, but also B, that there is a lot that is happening behind the scenes that we haven't been presented with this afternoon that we, we need to be mindful of all. And I'll remind everybody um, attending this afternoon to, to take a note of the information papers that are provided as part of the IOC assembly, where you can access uh, far more information on uh, not only more substance on what's been said this afternoon, but access to other information on what's happening in the capacity development sphere within the IOC. So without further ado, um, as we are now in the question and answer session, um, I've noticed that there are a few questions coming in uh, and that Johanna has answered a couple of them, um, but maybe for everybody else's benefit, Johanna, may maybe um, given that there are a couple there for you, if you, if you could just elaborate a little bit on a couple of questions and I'll, I'll read the first one out. So the first one was from Kevin Webb and she asks, do you have opposition from some governments for your work and how do you deal with these? Johanna. Well, well I, as I have um, written there, personally, I didn't have any experience so far. Um, although I have to say that, um, and I can't stress enough that um, working with national governments are very important when we want to inst institutionalize capacity development programs to build on um, their ocean science capacity or any capacity um, in, in that matter. Um, perhaps there are a lot of factors that make this very um, challenging. And um, for example, reaching out to member states or um, um, just an example, what happened in the survey <laughs> um, where we got very limited um, inputs from uh, national focal points, which is very important in informing us um, the capacity needs um, that require um, intervention um, um, in, their, in, in their countries. Um, so um, while there are a lot of factors that make this very um, challenging, I also believe that there are um, mechanisms in place and coordination um, efforts in place 
that would make this, um, I think, more doable. Okay, thank you, Johanna. Um, Kevin, is that a response that um, you recognize, or is there, is there anything more that you'd like to add? I mean, you can add it to the, the Q&A or to the chat, and, and if there's a follow-up that you'd like to add, please, please add them in there. Um, Johanna, as I have you, maybe we'll, we'll stick with the second question um, that was relating to the uh, needs assessment survey, and that was in relating to the gender balance. You highlighted that gender equality was relatively low down on the priorities as identified through the surveys, whereas we've heard through other talks, through Lewis's talk on the strategy review, uh, um, the fact that gender balance is still very important. So uh, is there anything more you'd like to say to that? Well, I definitely agree with um, seeing plan and on the importance of gender um, mainstreaming, especially in fields where um, uh, it's dominated by um, male, um, and I think that ocean science is is one. Um, um, for on on her on the question whether it's um, sex disaggregated, um, this time we haven't um, included that in the analysis or in the methodology, but um, it's something that is worth considering in the um, future repeats of the survey, and um, definitely um, something that um, we should. Um, look at um, um, something that can be addressed by capacity development um, interventions. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, Alan, um, yeah, sorry, sorry, Alan, but I think um, there is a one question. Um, the first question um, that um, I think we missed uh, from Fai Zayamani. Okay. Um, it's on the top part, but if I may also, because I put there that I want to answer this live. <laughs> And okay, it it says, what, what do you suggest as a mechanism to effectively address challenges that were highlighted? Well, I, I assume that the um, challenges that um, we are highlighting, we highlighted, for example, from the resources, for example, the lack of capacity um, to translate um, uh, science to um, policy. Um, if that is the, the challenge that um, he's referring to, um, and I think that Luis also has um, already mentioned this in, 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 in his presentation, the importance, for example, of um, the link between researchers and um, the national government or national research institutions. That is something that we can look at when we look at the results of the survey. Many countries do not have that um, policy um, that encourage that or um, that that link doesn't exist in their countries. So I think that that is one very practical mechanism that we can look at. Okay, thank you very much, Johanna. Um, okay, I'll move on to the other speakers now. So Claudia, um, I see there was a, a question there from uh, Vladimir, the IOC Executive Secretary who asks, what would, be the, what, what would be the potential to make OTG a, a permanent service and how can it benefit from cooperation with Westpac RTRCs, please? Uh, well, thanks for, for giving me the word. Well, I think uh, that's ex uh, in fact something that I, I tried to suggest is that uh, ocean teachers should become uh, more of a permanent and not project based for IOC and uh, and also uh, delivering and hosting services um, for other stakeholders uh, perhaps the constraint is precisely resources and currently uh, the acute need for more staff time uh, that is something that is really preventing us from uh, from uh, expanding from growing um, that would be yeah that would be what uh, what no, the first thing to address. Okay. And then uh, regarding uh, the benefit from cooperation with Westpac RTRCs, well, I'm I'm sure uh, uh, we can all learn from it from each other. And regarding uh, the possible, what Ocean Teacher could contribute would be specifically helping hosting uh, the online, um, uh, help uh, sharing the the training resources that are used on, uh, during the, the training courses uh, in the RTRCs, which I must admit my, my ignorance, I don't know how it is done currently. 
And of course, uh, working closer together with the training centers um, that work directly with ocean teacher in, in the West Pipe region. Okay, thank I don't know if this addressed the question. Thank you, Claudia. Well, Vladimir, if, if you would like to come back, please do so in, in the other chat or this Q&A. Um, uh, Claudia, I have just a quick question. You alluded to the effect, effectiveness of online training. It's partly influenced by wealth, which is obviously access to uh, infrastructure and IT equipment and whatnot. Have you been able to identify that through regions throughout the globe? I mean, it, 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 I mean, are there regions that suffer more than others, not only as from a, a, an individual basis, but from an institutional and maybe a, a national stage as well? Um, well, from our experience, uh, it's, it's a very short experience. We've been uh, organizing online courses only since one year from yeah, one year basically. So I can't say I have enough data for that. Um, but one thing that we've seen in the last year is that we are definitely reaching more people. Um, we may be able in the next few months to, um, to have some data regarding uh, dropout rates uh, from online courses okay. and compare them to face-to-face -face courses, to the effectiveness of the face-to-face -face courses that we organized uh, until 2019. Okay, thank you, Claudia. I see there's a couple more questions there for you. Um, I'm mindful of the time though, and I see Lewis there. So um, maybe it was given an opportunity for Lewis to uh, address some questions. And um, whilst I don't see any in the Q&A for you directly, Lewis, oh, yes, I do. I see, thank you, Lewis. Indeed, very important to reach policymakers. Serious decisions are made by them. Is there anything more you can add to that? Well, this is one of the key issues, and of course, we are. Uh, the timing now is ideal because we have the ocean decade going on, and this is exactly one of the objectives: is that we are able to reach um, the different stakeholders and the decision makers and policy uh, makers, so that we are able to convert uh, science uh, information into practice, into uh, concrete actions. And so this is the right timing. One of the things that we and maybe also addressing a bit uh, one of the questions here is uh, how can we make these uh, these um, the, the, the guidelines that we, we are promoting in IOC in terms of capacity development actions that we think should be priority actions. How can we make these rich decision makers? And again, this is where IOC has a critical role. What we found out in many cases is that these documents sometimes they sit somewhere on a desk and they don't reach the people who take the decisions. So that's why in the revision of the IOC strategy, we are now thinking of ways, even doing online documents, uh, making them available through social networks, uh, providing infographics, brochures, which um, highlight the key aspects that we want to transmit and that will maybe trigger some of these decision makers to go and read the, the more detailed documents, but yeah. we need uh, something which is fairly short, very concise, very precise, very practical, uh, so that we reach these decision makes. Because if we don't reach them, uh, it's it's uh, it's it's a bit useless. Also, there is a critical role of IOC representatives in doing this role. Also, many of them are associated to, to governments and, and to decision makers. And so make sure they promote these documents, not only the, the, the IOCCD strategy, but other IOC key strategic documents to the governments so that they take them into the implementation plan. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Luis. Um, we are now at time. We've had our one hour. Thank you all very much. Um, just to answer the questions for those people who are asking where can I get the slides, they will be uh, uploaded to the IOC capacity development or IOC slash cd.org uh, website after the webinar. So on that, I would like to thank everybody personally, uh, Johanna, Claudia, Luis, um, and Ariel, would you like to have a final say? Thank you all very much. And thank you to all the attendees uh, this afternoon. Oh, no, th th thank you. I would like to join you, Alan, in thanking our speakers, thanking our participants for joining us today in this webinar. And please encourage you to uh, forward your questions to, to speakers, to us, 
through the IOC Secretariat if there was something left. Uh, so once again, uh, thank you very much and uh, take care and be safe. Thank you all. Good thank afternoon. you. Bye. Bye.